on the wrap up and conclusions and we will start with a talk by Lyman Page on WMF Planck and the future of experimental cosmology. Please. Okay, is this, uh, I, I feel I should break into song with this microphone. But, um, okay, so I, I first uh, I just of course thank the organizers and, uh, and just say it's a, uh, it, it's such a, it's a great honor to, to be here and to be able to talk to you. Uh, at this time, the, you know, we, we followed uh, closely when the results came out, and I think, uh, I mean, it's all of us on the WMAP team are just, you know, think they're, they're stunning. They're, they're beautiful, uh, and, and I think it, it will, this is one of those times in history that, that changes the course of cosmology. Right? When the Kobe announcement did, I think the WMAP announced when those data came out, it changed it, and then, of course, with the release of Planck data, it's going to be a profound change, and it's, and it's great to be here and help you celebrate. Also, I uh, thank you for this broad canvas, the suggested talk, and I, I'm going to emphasize, uh, for, uh, I won't say, for the experimental cosmology, I'm going to talk about the microwave background, not all about all these other beautiful things that you've seen. And since in the future, we're all going to be showing Planck maps and Planck spectra and Planck this and Planck that. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about WMAP because it's going to be one of the last times I have I have to do that. We forgive you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, and I, I want to start with uh, uh, a bit of history and uh, let me just. I'm going to start with this slide here. What I'm going to do over those first few slides is run over every measurement made of the anisotropy in the microwave background, because the field's not that old and it's impressive about uh, it's impressive with what's happened. And the first half of this comes from the book that uh, that Jim led, uh, that you should all go out and buy, of course. Uh, and I and I wanted to note in case in case uh, his colleagues didn't know it, is this whole pursuit started with uh, an experiment, a measurement by Bruce Partridge and Dave Wilkinson in 1965 that was dedicated to go after the anisotropy. So I, don't, I think Bruce is probably not, not here now, uh, but you should just you know, congratulate him next time you see them. So these slides will go through. So here was their, their uh, upper limit that was done in, you know, in, a, in a field at uh, Princeton University. This is the, where the spectrum is. So this is, this is a, the whole assembly of measurements uh, and using a variety of techniques uh, from all from 65, 1965 to 19, 1979. This is the next set. And what I've done in the gray boxes here, just so you can mark the, advan the advances, so you can think of them, is the gray boxes are the average of the previous plots data, okay? So this is sort of an interesting era, because you can see, and this is where some biases come in, you can see here that if these folks that looking at the large scale had looked at degree angular scales, or these guys looking at small angular scales had looked at degree scales, and of course it's much easier to take these and focus on those scales. They had the sensitivity to detect the anisotropy. And, and uh, of course they didn't. Here we have the, uh, the this is when, when DMR came in. And uh, this is just the, the first showing of it, and you can see uh, what a great advance it was. Of course, it was the, uh, from a satellite at large angular scales. And, and I want to talk about, uh, focus on a couple of parameters through this. And one of them is, uh, I won't say too much about the optical depth, but another is on this, on the scalar spectral index. And I remember back here with this uh, uh, furs that I was, involved with, and actually Ken Ganga, your Ken Ganga was one of the first to actually go and fit the scalar spectral index to, to uh, data. And the, uh, so that was pretty neat, but from here, from when we started doing these fits, and of course they were done for DMR as well, we started doing those fits 
all the way through to WMAP, we should now keep in mind that those fits really don't mean much because they were missing this key element of the model and that was the optical depth because there's a large degeneracy with the optical depth and the scalar spectral index at the, at the sensitivities. I think actually Planck has moved beyond that, which is one of the great things. So, in, so we had, so in that, that you, when you see the parameter, that parameter on those old papers, take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so we moved on. Here you can start to see this rise to the first peak going. Again, the previous peak is becoming a little more evident here. This is the, the new millennium, and the first, uh, of course, Maxima came out, and Boomerang came out right there, and that really, you know, these really high sensitivity measurements, and that really, sort of, I think, was, was a marking point of the new era, and, and uh, we should just, uh, you know, pause to just recall, and this was really the work of uh, De Bernardes and Lang, and just we should remember how much uh, Andrew gave to the community, that it gave to the field, and especially to, uh, to Planck. Here's going on. Again, more analysis of Boomerang. You can really start to see things coming in. Here's and, uh, with, with uh, the DAISY experiment, uh, starting to fill out a little bit this, this uh, more of this high L tail. Again, 2003, so this is just before, uh, this is just before WMAP, the reanalysis of some other experiments, and you could really, you can start to see this whole structure developing. And then this is WMAP. And, and you can see, uh, well, you can see, there, I think it says a few things, and there's a long history of this. It's a, the average, this gray band, is a testament to the, the hundreds of people who made measurements over this period. There were no huge mistakes, right? The field got this right. And you could also see from going to, a, you know, a, uh, well, by Planck standards, a pretty insensitive instrument. But by going to all sky, we could, we could do lots of great things with WMAP. And of course, what you don't see on here and on any of these is, is the uh, many orders of magnitude in advance, uh, in advance of control of systematic errors, which is really, I think, what, what, one of the two things WMAP added from the instrumental point of view. OK, so now let me change gears here. And this is some, uh, I, I wouldn't call it dirty laundry, but you're, I, I want to show you in, in two suites how WMAP advanced. And so this is going back to that uh, first spectrum. And what I've plotted on here is the best fit uh, model for WMAP 9. And the, that's the red line. The blue lines are plus and minus 2 sigma. Okay, and I'm going to keep that model for the rest of the series of slides. And so that was the, that was the first release. And on this next slide right here. What I've plotted is, uh, is the data for, and I'll do this for all the experiments, minus that WMAP model divided by the sigma per point of, of the data, right? So you can, so the first thing to notice here, right, is, and how, how to think about this, if our WMAP9 model were a great fit to our first release, this would be, you know, th these would be scattered, you know, one third of them would be one sigma off of that blue line, right? Our last release did not agree that well with our first release, okay? And so, and so now I'm going to track these through and you can see how, how, these, how these build up and how they evolve. So here is, so that's, uh, so that was the first uh, WMAP. Uh, this is now the three-year. A number of other experiments were, were came here. The interferometers really started to come in. More South Pole experiments. Uh, a, another flight of boomerang. Uh, the beast experiment. Here they are. Here's the residuals. Okay. Again, so this is looking pretty good. Again, it's sort of a testament to the. The community, now I'm going to have to go, uh, since we probed ever sm small angular scales, uh, 
and uh, to lower and lower levels have to switch to a log scale. And I should say another thing, you know, I'm struck in our evolution of how to think about this, right, is, is this funny unit right there, which is, uh, if I have it right, I think Dick Bond and George Staff, you can correct me, that's based on assuming uh, a, a Einstein de Sitter model is the reason we have that convention that we all use, not what we have today. So this is a remnant of our old thoughts about the microwave background in that form, that form of the bunch of gammas for what cold dark matter should do at large angular scales. We should just remind ourselves, right, that we were thinking of it in terms of the wrong model for a long time. Anyway, here is the power spectrum again, and here are the residuals. Okay, so moving on, this is looking pretty good. Again, so these are the first, uh, around the first re uh, results from the South Pole Telescope and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope ACT, uh, the SZA, I, I, sorry, I rescaled this, uh, John, and it moved off the end there. Uh, so that's 2009, 2011. And you can see uh, here, these have not been corrected for secondary uh, emission, which are, and, and the, the residuals in the data, so you have to sort of take that out by eye. And then, anyway, here you can see the residuals. This is looking like we're zooming into a model. Here's the most recent. And you can see when you look at this plot, and this is, you know, no, notice the, emph the emphasis in the Planck results that we really want to, uh, uh, you know, you really have to look at residuals because it's so incredibly sensitive. So here, is, again, the model. Uh, in this plot, in the next panel, I'll show the SPT corrected for secondary emissions uh, by our team, not by the SPT team, and, and we think we have the correction here for ACT in blue, and, and this is the Planck spectrum. And that's where we are right now. So, it's, and this difference, this, is, this happens out here because it's just, the, that sigma there is really small. Okay, so we're getting a deviation, and this is guided to the, to the somewhat new model that, that differs, but not by much, from the WMAP model. You can see, actually, this is a, a poor way to show the ACT data because of just the, the way I, I took the residuals, and these are wide, uncorrelated bins. Uh, the SPT data have slightly more correlations, but it also gives you some indication of where it stands. Okay, so that's, that's where things stand now. And, and we'll see where they go in the future with future releases of, of uh, Plunk. Okay, so let me just, uh, again, because it's, this is one of the last times we'll be able to s tell you, uh, even differentiate WMAP from Plunk, or you might even want to hear about WMAP because we have this small error between them. And I say, already this is an amazing thing. You keep hearing 2%. The way to think about it is there is it's a one point, on average, a 1.2% difference in these experiments because you want to think about it in the map space, in the, and that's where you calibrate. And that's, this has led to all these multiple discussions, and we'll get to the bottom of it. I'm not, there's no questions about that. I mean, we'll figure it out. There's lots of, lots of will to do that on both sides. So how does WMAP different? Uh, we observe 30% of the sky in one hour with heavy, heavy cross-linking. Our, our gain model for nine years of observations for one of our channels is either three or four parameters. So every, every 15 milliseconds of data over nine years is governed by a model with three or four parameters. It's, it's amazingly stable. When we map our beams, and this is getting back to what Gary was saying, Gary showed a plot like that, this is getting back to what Gary was saying about why we have, so, you know, uh, this is not to say that we have everything right by any means, you know, we all, we all, don't get things right or mislead ourselves, but we have 17 seasons of Nyquist sampled Jupiter mapping to determine the beams and all the cross checks between them. Our noise model is independent of cosmology. It depends, our noise model depends only on the number of observations in a pixel. So that's a very strong statement about the stability of the instrument. Unitary transfer function, really low one over F, and as Gary talked about, we have side lobe mapping. Uh, we, we map the side lobes on the ground. Okay, so now I want to just take you through the WMAP data so you can see how much we evolved uh, over the years. And I, I think, uh, and, and Gary can probably agree with me, you know, every time we did this, we think we, we thought we had it right. 
And I'm not saying, <laughs> I don't refer, I'm not saying, you know, I, this is us. This is not about you guys. So anyway, so here's the first year. This was, uh, so this was the third year. You can see a change. We had a new gain model, small pointing error. Uh, we started actually physically modeling the beams. We changed the foreground cleaning, and we changed the way we were actually computing the power spectrum at, at large angular scales. So that's the first, the, the second release. Here's the third release. You can see a jump, right? We just reassessed the gain model by about 0.2% accuracy, more seasons of the beam, better measurements, more physical optics modeling. Our, our fit for the optics is way more complicated than the fit to the parameters, for example. It's, a, it's, a, and it's, a way, it's really time consuming to compute and improve likelihoods. We just kept, things kept evolving here. We just continued to improve. Again, I mean, you can see this is a pretty substantial uh, evolvement over the years until we, we ended up here. So this is where we are now. And, and you can see the last few years has sort of gone up and it's, it's, it's really stabilized. So we, uh, well, we, we think this is uh, pretty good. Okay, and I've also shown here, again, to compare to Kobe, that's the window function for Kobe and that's the window function for, for WMAP. Okay, so let me now go through and just give you, I, I, I think this is, sort of the WMAP team's take on where we are, but certainly maybe a little more uh, uh, biased towards, towards my take and, and what, I, what I think we actually we did as a team and, and where we're, uh, you know, and, and also where, where our real soft spots are. So what I, we, the, the, we, with these data, we could establish, I think, what's now the standard model of cosmology. And what's key to that is, was getting this optical depth which we didn't know about before. So we could actually do things like get at the scalar spectral index, which has now been gotten at so, so beautifully and so, so deeply by, uh, by Planck. It's, it's just an absolutely stunning measurement. So here's the value we have, and that's like go, goes into WT. And I, we don't need to do much, so just scan. These are, these are in agreement. This is my favorite combination, of course. But these, these are in agreement, right? This, is, this basic model is, is really solid. And uh, you know, can, we can re, re amaze Jim again that it still it passes this incredible test. You, you just need these six parameters. And, and I can tell you where our soft spot is here is our probability when we, so we have this great noise model, our probability to exceed that is, is 0.3%. So by that standard, you know, you'd like, to, you'd like that to be 0.11 or 0.2 or even 0.05 or something like that. And it is 0.1 or 0.2 or uh, in that limit when we look at the temperature data at large and small angular scales. When we add the polarization data, the large angular scale of polarization data, it drives this down. The fit is not good. Okay? So as, and Gary was emphasizing that. I think that's a real, that's a weak spot. And, and uh, we've already seen some indications like, you know, of cleaning the, uh, cleaning the WMAP data uh, with, uh, with the 350 gigahertz uh, dust map may make a real difference there. So that's, real, that's a, a way we have to improve. So this is, anyway, this is the first thing I'd say we did. This is the other thing, and I, and I, don't, I, I don't think this has been, uh, maybe we just all know it and, and pass it off. Matthias mentioned it. To me, this is an amazing thing. This is so fundamental. That, and the key here is, just uh, I, I won't say it as well as Matthias did, but here is the horizon size, that decoupling right there. This is larger than the horizon size. The polarization comes from gradient flow of electrons right, in, this, in the primordial plasma into gravitational wells or off of hills. That gives rise to the polarization. So the polarization, so the flow is correlated with the density on larger angular scales here than the size of the horizon. So those fluctuations had to come over the horizon. Right? And Turok, oh, he's not on here. Turok and colleagues had cooked up a bunch of models in which you could get this whole power spectrum here using subhorizon physics. 
So this is really, this is a key and important result. And the third thing I think we did was get a, we got a good start on the early universe parameters, inflation parameters. And, uh, and here I, I uh, let me just jump, we should jump right to the, the Planck results, which are, I just, just blow my mind uh, for a few reasons. One, they're so robust to, to variations in the model. I think this is, this is an, a huge triumph. Uh, they blow my mind because of the uh, Chibazov and Mukhanov paper, which long before any of these measurements were made said, and, and others, that this should not be, this should be, we should have a slight tilt. It shouldn't be Peebles, Harrison, Zeldovich, which is an amazing uh, prediction based, I mean, this is just the prediction based on physics at, you know, less than 10 to the minus 20 seconds. It's, it's amazing. It's really, uh, it's really something. So this is, this, and so this plot is fantastic. I don't know, after listening to uh, uh, Andrew Linde's talk, you know, if we find R right there, whether we have, we're going to say we have stabilized the moduli, or we have, you know, we know we're on the Kähler potential, or we are in DVI inflation, or something like that. But, uh, but you know, we will push down and try to, and, and get at that, um, and, and, and measure R. The best limit now for reference from the B modes of polarization is, is somewhere up here, from Cynthia's around somewhere, from, this is from the BICEP experiment. And I think the other thing, and this is something that I, I guess I, uh, Jim Peebles has emphasized more than once, so we, you know, it's great to talk about R in terms of inflation. I think the real import is just, this would be, this would be a, a connection, finally, with, with quantum fields and gravity. I think that's, that's going to be the import, right? We'll, we can end up with a spot here and there might be 50 models to explain it, right? The import is this very deep connection. And that's, I think, how it should be, how, how it should be solved. Okay, so this is amazing. And of course, FNL, which likely won't be bettered for, for a decade, maybe two, with just another mind-blowing uh, result from Planck. Okay. Anomalies. I, I really liked it in the parameters paper. It was in quotes, and I think I'm a little less agnostic about this than, than Gary. Uh, for me, it's uh, you know, for me the most obvious. I cannot look at a map without seeing that Stephen Hawking initial right there. And you guys, I mean, it's so close you couldn't choose a color scale to hide that. But there it is, right? And you will be cursed, you know, once you see that every time you look at a map to see those initials. That's as non-Gaussian as you can get. <laughs> right? But no, there's no prior. Other, you know, you hear about the cold spot down here. This is bigger and I think just as deep. Right? Uh, and, and not, and, and I should say, I, I, I'm, of, I, I'm agnostic in these, you know, this one, okay, you don't have to explain this one. We should try to figure out if something's going on there. What I think really is anomalous is the, for the quadrupole, right? The hottest spot and the coldest spot are in the galactic plane. Right. That's why you see low quadrupoles. When you look at the whole sky, which Planck can finally do, you'll see a quadrupole, and we'll stop hearing about anomalously low quadrupole. Okay. It's just those, those are in the plane. Okay, these fingers that have been talked about, that guy, that guy, that guy, in the, in the, in the whichever hemisphere you want to put them in, those have been around since Kobe. Right. That, it's just... You see them again, and you get excited again, and they die down. Those I remember talking with, uh, with Chuck about them a long time ago. So those have been there, and, and to me, that, that's, a real, uh, that's a real anomaly to, to me. So anyway, that's, uh, that's how I think of those. And that's the, if I had to pick one to focus on, that would be the, that would be the one. But it's also, it seems, it seems uh, not highly unlikely. Okay, so I want to go through now jumping to the future, and the future here is a bit of um, the future here just in, in uh, through the eyes of someone working on microwave backgrounds experiments. So these are, and I hope I didn't miss anybody, these are the experiments to measure the, the low L polarization, the direct measurement of the B modes. And, and uh, I've often, you know, you often hear, why are there so many? How come there have to be so many? Shouldn't there be fewer? Why don't you pick one and all that? And I, I, that's really not the way to look at it. These are not, ex these are not expensive experiments. 
These are, you know, this is a competitive and dynamic field, and these are all developing really different technologies, developing them with students, developing them quickly. And this, is, this, this quest all throughout the history of the microwave background has just been to develop absolutely fantastic new instruments that, that have had ripple effects. So here, let me, I'll go through them uh, 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 briefly, the ones I have slides for, but they're all over the place. Here's the, uh, the top. Of course, you know, Planck, we can't wait to hear about that. These are, these are balloons. These are just proposed. Uh, I won't, won't touch on them. And these are the ground-based experiments from Tenerife to, to, uh, to Chile to the, the, the uh, Antarctic. Um, before I'm just sort of scanning through the, the what we have, let me just c give you the, uh, sort of give you the game, what's going on, and this is from an experiment that, uh, that Suzanne Staggs leads. This is, so here's the E-mode spectrum. Here's B for R of 0.05, and, and uh, so that is below, so recall something, if, if uh, M squared phi squared is right, and the sound speed is one, in theorist units, and then, then it will be higher than that. The B modes will be higher than that. And this is, these are sort of typical error bars you can get. And these are, this is given these sensitivities and those are, have already been achieved with this instrument in the field. So it's just a matter of time to get in, to getting down there. And you can see sort of what's gonna happen is here are the foreground levels there. And here's the lensing. So we'll get down to some level, who knows where it is, R of 0.03, R of 0.02, and then it's gonna get harder. And we need, we can't do single frequencies, we have to do multiple frequencies to push down to say that level, 0.01, or even, even lower. We saw some of the slides in Apollo's talk, you know, 0.00, people are getting realistic about 0.001. So that's, that's I think, what will happen over the next few, and these, these are many, you know, a lot of data is being taken, this will all happen, uh, uh, this will happen over the next few years. Okay, this is, this is from a paper uh, by Joe Dunkley, but she tells me the actual plots were made by, by Clive Dickinson. And here is just uh, frequency, so you can see the best place to look and how, how possible is this. So, so uh, this is the uh, power spectrum, and here, the, um, here we see the foregrounds, and this one is for different fractions of the sky. And what you can see is that for R of 0.01 in something, and this is averaged around, so L of 80 to 120, is, is there's a few hundred square degrees at least that are below, or sorry, the B modes are above the, the foregrounds. So there's some real, there's some, there's some hope there. And the model is WMAP synchrotron plus uh, something uh, FDS dust map with 2% with polarization. And, and it, by eye, it looked like when I saw those, those uh, P to I maps that were shown, that looked like it was possible in the coldest spots of the sky. So this isn't, this isn't too far off. And then here's, here's another, uh, another way to look at it. So this will be, the, uh, the, I think, the game for a while. So let me next now cycle through um, some of these experiments. So this is, I think, the most advanced one right now. This is the bicep experiment through its various uh, in incarnations uh, down at the pole. And, and they're advancing with, with years of data in the can. We should hope to, to see something from them uh, before too long. This is, this is another version of it. These are, uh, Chow Lin sent these to me. And you can just see, I mean, first, just don't, I mean, this is, a, you know, this is a, a, like an old, this is just a real telescope here. And, uh, but, People have had to develop things like new level, new types of multi broadband filters, uh, anti-reflection coated lenses, uh, a whole new classes of detectors uh, to, to, to do this. So, and here's their, their timeline. And they're just going to keep going, adding frequencies, and just keep, of course, drilling down. Here's a, here's a different approach. So this is with, uh, with uh, stags, and this is actually, 240 machined feeds, each with an aperture about the size of a dime. And this is all cold optics, so this just looks out there. These are all cold optics, and this one has a spinning half-wave plate in front, a warm one, and it, it looks like with that, you can actually stabilize, stabilize fluctuations in the sky 
up to uh, well longer than a half an hour. So you can really just, you can fix the, the sky. Here's another Cody in, in, um, on, on Tenerife. So this is low frequencies, going after low frequencies. And I think you guys have started taking data already. Um, class uh, going after the very largest angular scales from the, from the ground uh, in Chile. It's becoming a popular place down there. This is uh, the, the EBEX experiment. So this is, this is just flown, so they had a long flight. You can see that this is the sorts of array technologies here. And uh, they, had, they had some difficulties, but I hear they have lots of data and a bunch of smart people, they'll figure it out, right? And we should look forward to a, to a result from them. The spider experiment, you can see how different these all are. Here's a spider experiment, uh, which will fly later this year. I know there are many here in, involved in it and it's sort of driven to, to, uh, to complement Planck. Piper from Goddard, yet another, because all these things are 5,000 detectors, various combinations of cold and warm optics. Uh, some people switch in different arrays, plans for different arrays every few years, different modulators. All, it's a whole slew of different really inventive techniques. Here's one from these guys, just a, a whole new type of detector array. Right. So 5,000 detectors in each frequency <coughs> band. So those are the large scale questions. We'll see, this is something uh, for, you know, we have a, these telescopes, especially now you've seen results from ACT and SPT. You know, these, one nice thing about a large telescope is you can get a lot of detectors in a focal plane. You'll see in a few minutes, we're talking about, you know, uh, of order 20,000 detectors before too long. And it would be great if we can look at the largest Five minutes, wow, largest angle, really? Okay, for largest angular scales, I'm gonna go over this really quickly, okay. So, can we get to them? And, and we don't know. We're gonna find out. South Pole's got great atmosphere. Chile's got large cross-linking. Um, so we will, we'll find out. Okay, so here's what's coming down the line, and this will happen. So here's polar bear, Atacama, act in the Atacama, South Pole Telescope, of course, at the South Pole. And something by 2016, there'll be tens of thousands of detectors looking at the sky. This is not long. What's so great about it is this is now the polarization from Planck. Let's go to smaller angular scales. Here are the foregrounds. What happens with the polarization is the sky is cleaner in polarization than temperature. You peer right through the foregrounds because the CMB is more polarized than the foregrounds. Right? We're in a new era where we're gonna measure properties, these parameters, with the polarized CMB to make sure it all works. So that's coming, both ACT and SPT will do that. What's the science? Uh, of course, early universe parameters, maybe there's running at some low level. Some of the neutrino masses to about 0.06 EV, and this is, this is sort of decade time scales, right? From ground-based measurements, early dark energy, uh, curvature, these are mostly coming through measuring the lensing of the microwave background. Um, and structure formation throughout the ages. Let me go quickly through, uh, through a few of these. Uh, uh, this is for a version that, that uh, Mike Nemack and Jeff McMahon put together for something in the future on ACT. We have a, the telescope has a huge focal plane and we'll just fill it up. Here, we, we heard a question on Euclid. How well will, the, how well will these complement the, uh, the ground-based, you know, lensing, uh, lensing-focused telescopes? Here's just an example. Sudeep Das made this of the sorts of things you can do with sigma-8 and the neutrino mass by combining various probes. LSST plus these uh, lensing surveys. You can see you can do extraordinarily well. Here's for South Pole Telescope. They have, of course, uh, this they are right here, right now, planning to advance uh, um, significantly, and you can see their noise improving with time, right? And these, I should say, these, especially from Atacama and, and the Pole, these really complement themselves in overlap in where in the sky they look, right? Because we'll want to look at, we'll want to gather data from as much as the sky as we can. And here's polar bear, which is uh, just starting to take data now from the Atacama. And here's a happy polar bear worker completing one of these amazing rays of, uh, that, that's now observing the sky. Let me, uh, I want to briefly touch on this question of another CMB satellite and 
And to my mind, it's just obvious that this has to happen. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't know which, and I couldn't presume to know which, which is going to be the best technology. But this is, the, the microwave background is just this incredibly pure <coughs> signal full of tons of information about all epochs of the universe, whether, you look at, whether you're looking at lensing, whether you're looking at 10 to the minus, whatever, 35 seconds, whether you're looking at the whole process. Uh, so I think it has to happen, and all of our, you know, ESA and NASA should all be uh, uh, thinking about this, keeping it in their mind. Uh, I just want to highlight one of them, and Rashid mentioned this one, and, and so did uh, uh, Paolo. It's just, it has become possible now again, there are serious thoughts about designing instruments to measure not only the polarization, but also measure the spectrum at the same time to these new levels, which opens up whole new channels of physics. This is just the Pixie model. A lot more work needs to be done, but this is just fantastic, fantastic science. And so, you know, support your local CMB group in, in, in this uh, development. Okay, I want to finish up here with a couple of slides. This is uh, prompted by a question yesterday from somebody in the, the audience about looking at the microwave background over a long time. So this is uh, from a project, actually, uh, a, a project with a senior, it was a senior thesis. Uh, the student did this with me a few years ago, and at the same time, Douglas Scott and, and colleagues were doing it. And what we, just, what we wanted to look at is if you could tell, measure the expansion of the universe by looking at the change in the microwave background as the universe expanded, because the photosphere moves out. <laughs> Right, so the, spot, the patterns, the spot patterns change as the universe expands. So this is what the, and I'll show you a movie of it in a minute. This is what happens to the power spectrum. And you can see, so this is with the temperature in it. So the temperature gets reduced, so the amplitude gets reduced, but a lot more happens there. This is with the temperature decrease scaled out. And you can see you just get these, these scales relative to now get washed out. You can plot the correlation with the current CMB, and you can see these small angular scales get washed out. These largest structures will last for 100 billion years, right? These, lar these large structures that have been, have been identified, those fingers, are going to be the largest lasting structures in the universe. Okay? They're, they'll be around for billions of years. This is, let's see if I can get this going. Is that going good? That's what it looks like. Here's the time. In billions of years from now, it'll reset, and as the universe evolves, hopefully, go click it again. It'll. That's. Uh, that's what we'll be able to see. Okay. So that's how the universe changes now. Can we measure it? Okay, so here is, uh, here is taking two maps, and I, I think I talked to a couple of you yesterday, I was, I was misremembering, but this is with an array of 3,000 by 3,000 detectors, and which is, as you can see with the recent advance, is not far from what we can do right now. So this is just an array of 3,000 by 3,000 detectors. You can measure the sky for one year in, say, 10 years, Measure the sky for one year in 110 years. Take the difference in maps. Look at the power spectrum. And that's what you get with error bars. So we can measure it. Right? We can measure it with a very, very minor extension to what we know. And this is, I, I, this is, I guess, to maybe even whet your appetite more for the po just the types of things you could do with more of these future satellite observations with the microwave background. Now, this one's a little... We'll write a proposal for this now. Maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll get something. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Anita. Okay. You've given a very a great uh, an overview of the future of CMB. You're giving a great overview of the future of CMB cosmology. Uh, 
can you just give a, a short uh, you know highlight of what is your uh, thought about uh, other important branches in experimental uh, cosmology like uh, BAOs, for example, or, or distant supernovae. You're asking to make enemies. No, the, uh, okay, so uh, for me, I, I just, I love this BAO work just because it's so geometric. And, I, and that you can do it in 21 centimeters and maybe cross-correlate it in, with these optical surveys. Uh, you know, I think, Things like you know, hearing about the Euclid satellite, I just, it just blows my mind. I have to admit, I was talking with Martin Rees about this. It's, I, you know, for, for the, say the US satellite version, W first, I'm much more excited about the second part of it. Seeing that, you know, that, that not, so not so much the W, but all this other science from getting three-dimensional power spectra, seeing structure grow from the first moments to now, I think that's just incredibly exciting. And however we can do it, we should do it. I don't know if that answers your question. But that's the, so those particular probes, Euclid would be fantastic. The BAO measurements, 21 centimeter work, I, I think it's all great. So, Enrique? Yeah, uh, I have uh, a comment, uh, several comments, on your uh, allusion to the anomalies of the yeah. largest, um, that there are spots that are uh, larger, and therefore, by eye, you could see that maybe they are uh, more significant in, uh, as a departure from the standard model. But I, I don't think that's the, the right way to see this, uh, because First, uh, these spots that you mentioned there, the central one, the one in the, in the right, uh, they first they are overlapping the galactic plane. So w one has to be uh, a bit uh, cautious uh, of on using this information, right? Because contamination is, is important there. The other thing is that being larger does imply that uh, it's uh, been a, a more significant departure from the standard model because uh, the cosmic variance is playing against, against you. So uh, larger scales uh, are more affected by the co cosmic variance. So significant, you have to do the statistics to, to, to say mm -hmm. that. And then uh, the reason why the, the small uh, cold spot for you is a very tiny thing there in the, the right, uh, in, the, in the, the south, yes. Uh, the reason this is, was uh, identified as some, something uh, peculiar was not uh, by looking at uh, as it is there, right. no, I, but I'm because uh, when you look at in in wavelets, what you do is you eliminate the smaller scales, much smaller scales, and much larger and large scales. scales yeah. And that's the reason this is uh, significant. You are removing the, the cosmic variance for the larger scales. And then you get something at the order of, uh, let's say, three sigma, or if you, if you do a posteriori statistics, right. then it could be a little bit less, but it's, it's around that. And finally, I would like to say that, uh, yeah. here's the final comment, <laughs> is that there's a paper by, by Gott et al, because I didn't do the analysis for the larger scales yeah. because of the mask, but uh, there's a paper by Gott et al, 2007, they used the genus and they uh, concluded that the largest scales, uh, scales uh, below a uh, multiple eight, are uh, um, in agreement with the standard model, the two sigma level. Yeah. So this is so that I, you know, all that's fine. My good friend Dick Bond has spent a lot of time looking at statistics of this spot, right? And, and I, and it's I would be doing the same thing. I just don't put a lot of. It, it's it's not the. I'm, it doesn't excite me as ma as much as other things. Okay. Do, last anyway. question <laughs> from Reno. Lyman, I think we have given a very a broad and complete uh, uh, panorama of the future scenario on C the CMB experiments. And uh, at some point, we were asking uh, another CMB, CMB experiment, and uh, your answer is yes. For the satellite? For the satellite. Oh, I, I, no, yeah. for the satellite. No. I slightly disagree in the sense that uh, in the future, if you want to be this community, if uh, this community wants to be, uh, how do you say, credible, we need to have some uh, new and fresh ideas uh, based on fundamental physics. We cannot uh, uh, look for a, another CMB experiment because people, uh, I mean people, uh, people, decision makers could be not uh, following uh, this. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have uh, understood my point. Your, your, your shading of this? Well, maybe I didn't phrase it the right way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you, very, thank thank you, you very much. The next speaker will be Marco Bassanelli. Questions to be tackled by a blank with the next release.